Welcome to the FMCG, guys. This is Daniel Torres. Hello, Efrain. How are you? Hi. Hi, Daniel. Good to be with you as always. Excellent. I know that you're set up to go for a skiing trip in February, right? Yeah, yeah, that that is uh that's actually a kind of a become a, a regular habit for us is that um since moving to Europe we've gone every year uh to go skiing somewhere. So we've uh we've been learning about skiing through my daughter's eyes, I like to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not a big skier, I have to say. I've only gone been there three times, but here in Barcelona it, the slopes are not that far away, surprisingly. Like in actually one hour and a half, if you go very fast, you can be at the ski slopes. Maybe two hours would be more realistic. And even Barcelona is applying or potentially will apply to host Winter Olympics. So uh, skiing is pretty big here. I think it's big. Yeah. I mean, I think it's uh, it's it's growing in popularity, right? And I think uh, uh, given the, the, the last two, three years we've been through, uh, thinks people's desire to be outside skiing yeah. makes a whole lot of sense in terms of just the natural beauty of it and uh, the sport part of it as well because it's it's yeah. not an easy sport to learn no to no no tell me about it <laughs> so today we're actually gonna mix skiing which is very popular and i'm sure that a lot of our audience also skis with another very popular topic which is direct to consumer so yeah it's definitely something that's been very top of mind. And I think um, for those of uh, in our audience who've listened to some of our recent episodes, you'll see that it's come up quite a bit. So um, we're excited to have this uh, this next guest with us to kind of help continue to, to learn from her. Exactly, exactly. So our guest today is working for one of the most iconic ski equipment companies, which is Rossignol, headquartered in, in France, um, but she's actually Italian. Her name is uh, Laura Benedettino. She has a very interesting track record in e-commerce and direct-to-consumer in general, um, having worked in the past, for example, for BF brands and, and Vans particularly there. And she's currently the Group VP of Omnichannel Direct-to-Consumer at Rossignol. Omni, and it's important to know that Omnichannel Direct-to-Consumer at Rossignol actually means online plus physical stores plus par online partnerships. So she's really doing the holistic part of direct to consumer. So at the moment, and uh, almost uh, four years now, um, I'm uh, at Rossignol Group, uh, and I have global responsibility for a direct to consumer business, meaning uh, I'm responsible for the dot com, the marketplaces, and the physical retail direct uh, stores. And we have around 30 stores uh, globally. This is a new business for Rossignol. I mean, they started uh, again some years ago because it's, uh, I mean, going from a traditional ski manufacturer from uh, from them to a consumer-centric uh, approach. And that's also why, I mean, obviously the company started with the um, direct-to-consumer business to be more and more close to the uh, consumer that are really engaged for a brand like Crossignol. Yeah. yeah, and this, is, this happens to be one of our, our hottest topics, right, Daniel, in terms of talking about D2C. And, uh, yeah, so definitely. it's great that you're with us. That so you can uh, impart some of your knowledge in this area, given you know what you've seen and done over your career. Definitely, and I mean something unique from Laura, who, who I've known her for I think close to a year. We've been in touch. Is that she's actually managing both? She's really the, the complete DTC, right? Because it's not only about e-commerce, which is what we normally link DTC with, but it's also the physical retail, which. Ultimately, it's probably the holistic experience that one wants to deliver to, to customers, right? Yeah, the idea is really to put, obviously, the customer at the center and to basically with him uh, across all the touch points being digital or physical. Uh, and even when we do some projects like um, partnership with department store or any other important shopping shop, it's still uh, uh, us working with our colleagues um, to make sure that the experience at the shopping shop, it's, uh, I mean, the best that they can have have uh, from visual perspective, so in design, uh, but also from digital point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you came through to where you are now, through quite an interesting career path, because obviously you're doing physical and e-commerce. I know that the 
previous, what, 10 years or so but prior to that you were doing e-commerce. But how did you, well, maybe you can tell us a bit about briefly about sure. your career path and how you ended up there. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm I always covered like analytical roles. Uh, I was lucky enough to always have uh, great managers uh, in uh, in very good companies. Uh, so I learned really a lot and, and fast from uh, all, all of my managers and my colleagues. Uh, I've been working in product marketing in uh, product merchandising, uh, then transition in sales and then transition into digital um, back in 2009, something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been focusing on digital for a while, but then uh, when I was at the VF Corporation working for Bands and the North Face, actually the bigger umbrella was direct to consumer department. Mm -hmm. So how it's set up today at Rossignol, it's, I mean, very similar to other companies I've, I mean, experienced in the past where digital is part of direct to consumer. It's a unique team with uh, many roles that are cross channel. Um, and, and so, voila, although I was, uh, focusing and responsible for the digital business, uh, I always experienced the, the physical channel with the colleagues, uh, with oh, stores, yeah. going to stores, uh, going through, uh, let's say, omnichannel projects, uh, um, which could be, you know, endless sale in a store from uh, others like Click and Collect or like very small one to, to bigger one that we launched uh, later on. Um, so I always like had um, this, um, I mean, experienced this uh, uh, kind of an um, setup. Um, and so after that, I joined Rossignol, where in a smaller scale, because obviously coming from big brands like Vans and the North Face, going to Rossignol, which is big, but obviously it's smaller than that. Um, I, I was able to, let's say, apply my learnings and my experience to a brand that uh, was starting with it. Um, and um, I think the uh, the also considering the size of the business, the size of the team, uh, the best, uh, let's say, organization that uh, I I thought it was uh, applicable to the brand was uh, a, a cross-channel one, where I have in the team some people that are going vertical to the channel and some people that manage both, uh, for instance, technology, uh, for instance, uh, merchandising, planning, buying, allocation. So all the stock management, it's, um, it's done by a team that for follows both, both channels. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you started in uh, product and merchandising because um, a few months ago we interviewed Lucia Marcuzzo, who's the VP, SVP, I believe, of Northern Europe for Levi's. And I think Efrain, I don't know if you remember, but I think she's also started in a very analytical yeah. role and then went into more commercial. Yeah, no, you're right, you're right. But I think it's it's a, it makes for a great foundation. Right, because you get to see, um, in essence, you know the the point of sale directly in terms of like, you know what is actually driving conversion, what's driving, um, in some cases, even footfall into some into actual physical yeah, store. So yeah, also data about consumer, which is yeah. now it's it's a big topic about you know CRM and uh, uh, what is really about CRM. It's really the brand that owns the data. I mean, sometimes uh, can be scary. But uh, yes, I mean, for consumer. But yeah, in the end, it's basically get to the data and get to understand uh, the needs or the behavior, mainly the behavior, to anticipate also uh, what the next step can can be. So data yeah. sometimes tell you, well, many times data are basically the key. Yeah, I mean, I think consumer proximity and uh, um, data and access and just familiarity and comfort with data and analytics. I mean, those two things I think are, are becoming even more critical than they've been in the past. So again, having yeah. that foundation makes a whole lot of sense. So um, I'm curious to ask you, because like you said, you've been in digital in some way, shape or form since 2009. How, how, was, how was that back in, you know, back in 2009 in terms of making the jump from, let's call it more traditional brick and mortar physical store type of role moving into digital at that point in time. How was that transition for you? Well, as I said, for me was, uh, 
smooth and I mean me as a curious person obviously I mean it 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 went fast I was very lucky to have very good managers at that time that had already an experience in digital uh, either here in Europe or even with the US with my prior manager that uh, at VF came from US which had started obviously with the e-commerce uh, way uh, before um, way before uh, Europe um, then what I noticed is like uh, especially in some when it was at the time was with luxury brands uh, everybody was really reluctant I mean there was a lot of like skepticism about digital um, because I mean because it was new simply it was new um, so I think change management was really uh, the late motive and the fear rouge that uh, I experienced so far in all the brands uh, I've been working with. Um, Channel Conflict, uh, which in the end uh, was transformed into both channel success because direct to consumer does not, um, is not something that uh, um, destroy your traditional channel, your wholesale channel, but actually something that support. And then in the end, it's a win-win for uh, both channels and for the brand um, itself. So that was uh, actually a very common, let's say, aspect that I saw in luxury, in outdoor, in, you know, in all the brands I experienced. And uh, in the end, we, I mean, we managed, always managed successfully. Um, and for me, I mean, as I said, it was a natural, kind of natural step, meaning I was doing product merchandising. And from there, I started doing uh, product digital merchandising, mm. uh, which many aspects were actually the same, you know, notion of the stock management and sell through and how to set up a store. And then from there, you learn instead of using traditional tools, you, I mean, you end up using uh, uh, technologies and platforms that are quite immediate in terms of usage and user-friendly. Um, I've worked with many, many platforms, Magento, WebSphere, Shopify, uh, actually Salesforce, um, transition into Salesforce. Um, so all of them have been built by obviously great companies for, for company to manage their business and succeed. Um, and so in the end, even for a, for a junior person that starts, uh, it's not, if you have a good mentor, good manager and good tools, I mean, it's kind of easy. Mm -hmm. And if you had to summarize it, like in the last, what, 30, no, yeah, 13 years that you've been in, in digital, what, what are the main changes that you, that you can perceive from there to now? Um, well, um, I'm not sure it changes. I mean, so for sure, technology go fast. So one 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 thing it's uh the fact that technology keeps changing and evolving and you need to stay really really on that um the change uh, the real change that that they've seen is uh that the fact that people got used to it well that's that's a no brainer i mean uh not only young people, uh, not only, I mean, brands, I mean, but everybody, I mean, who even who was reluctant and sometimes is still the case in many companies, many industries, for instance, consumer goods or uh, electronics, consumer goods um, are a little bit behind in terms of digital versus like uh, fashion or uh, outdoor, so apparel in general. Um but for sure, I mean, people now are, I mean, technology is our day-to-day. -day. People spend the entire day on their phone. Uh, the biggest change that I've seen was the this, this switch between uh, from desktop to mobile. Um, and uh, also, you know, the sales from mobile, because actually people have started browsing from mobile, but then now people are shopping from mobile in uh, one or two clicks. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that transition. I think that that's something that we kind of forget about. No? Yeah, we forget about. Yeah, actually, we, I was about to say the same. We actually yeah, forget yeah, yeah. about it. But yeah, I mean, ten years ago, it was not the case. Actually, it was uh, yes from desktop or from mobile mm, mm -hmm. was not so. Uh, I mean, as it is today. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think you're starting to see some of that. I mean, well, you've seen it for quite some a few years now. But in terms of like uh, media spend as well, right? yeah, in terms of like, of you know, like mobile 
Yeah, it's completely Ab- overtaken. Absolutely. And also, I mean, investments that uh, brands are, are doing uh, is uh, on uh, is on digital in the end, and digital investment is not only to support e-commerce but to support the brand presence uh, in a digital landscape. Um, and uh, and then yes, of course, I mean actions that are done for mobile. So at the time there was no the mobile responsiveness design uh, or apps. Uh, so of course mm-hmm. this is all different today. Well, and I, I think it's interesting too. You've you've mentioned um, in an earlier response that you know in the early days of digital, a lot of the discussion or the you know, one of the common barriers that you came across was channel conflict. Whereas like what you describe now um, in terms of the trends you're seeing is, is that, you know, we kind of have to go where the consumer goes, right? Which is the consumer doesn't typically tend to say, I only shop in one channel or I do everything in terms of like from discovery to actual purchase in that one channel. You really have to be an omni-channel type of retailer to be able to succeed. So how has that been? Like, are there any like things like along the way in terms of like, you know, that you've seen and you've witnessed the other within the companies you've worked at, or even just at an industry level in terms of that movement to more of an omni-channel view? Yeah. Well, I think the secret is basically to follow the consumer, understand where the consumer is and what is doing. And in the end, consumer don't even know what what channel is. I mean, we do because we work in the industry. But actually, if you ask someone what's what what wholesale means or retail means or what is shopping shop or its consignment, I mean, in the end, for them, it's okay the brand and the product, uh, no matter where it is. So, it, and we see it actually every day. Many people shop um, some products of a brand uh, in a multi-brand store, and in the okay. end, if they have a problem. The majority, in the majority of the cases, they contact the brand directly through the website saying, oh, sorry, I had this product, I have an issue, or I would like to replace that, or, I mean, I have, I don't, it's just a question about the product. They don't go back to the place where they have, sh- I mean, shopped, basically, but they just contact the brand and they expect the brand to reply. So I still see some brands say, Oh, sorry, you need to go back to where you bought the product. But actually, this is not the best consumer experience that you can provide. It's and one people of my will biggest pet peeves. Exactly. So in the end, you know what? Yeah, you are the I mean, I have this product from this brand. I contact the brand. That's it. I expect an answer from the brand because I mean, it's simply uh, naturally uh what what uh, I would expect as a as a user. So uh, what people, I mean, what brands have done, like in the industry, I think it's realizing that, uh, yeah, people were, uh, if you want to get in touch and want to have these people on your side because uh, you, your brand matter to these people, uh, you're going to stay on your side and basically uh, fill their needs um, and provide them um, a good um, experience, uh, whatever, whatever this means, could be a question about the product could be a request of uh, um, defective product to replace or something to repair uh, could be just uh, information about uh, something um, could be purchasing a product and uh, or asking about um, where can I find it and even if you don't control I mean you should control 100% your distribution and so have at least the basic answer uh, and not saying uh, you know you can find this product in my store or online but actually I don't know in your area uh, where you, you have it because you should at least be able to provide information about where your product is present in that uh, in that area so basic stuff like that uh, in the end sometimes you know omnichannel is a, is a buzzword uh, what omnichannel really means on top of having uh i mean it's not, i mean technology of course that that's that's the base of course if you don't have technology you can't do many things uh that people expect today like uh, shop online and return in store of course in its technology because in the end it also has a financial impact on um, accounting flows reconciliation and all that that uh, in the end company needs to <laughs> to to manage anyhow so once you have that then uh, it's uh, it's all about putting yourself in the shoes of the consumer understand where he's going and why and uh, basically put things together Mm-hmm. And to create like, well, I think we're going in that direction, but to create like a, a fantastic like shopping experience for the consumer 
between physical retail, digital, which you manage, but also influencing wholesale. What's the secret sauce there? Huh. Well, uh, first, um, no, about to say. So first, I mean, I think old brands. So people today shop products, of course, but they shop. For, for brands. And we know from many data, from many statistics that more and more, and especially younger generation, will be close to brands that uh, have a purpose. So you make products, but you need to have a purpose and, and to let people know why you are doing these products and what's your the ultimate goal like of, of the company. And and so I think storytelling in that sense, in that direction, it's it's key and it's crucial to, to consumer today. Um, because in the end, how do you drive people uh, with you uh, if there are, I mean, millions of brands out there? I mean, if I want to buy a jacket, I mean, how many brands that do jackets, I mean, are there? So, and many of them, of course, they have a similar usage, a similar price point. Um, so in the end, if you want to be unique and, and matter, uh, you need to add something uh, uh, on top. Um, so how they do it, um, you know, we have brands around us that, um, did, I mean, some, uh, actions. I mean, I, I mean, if I can mention other brands too, uh, in the industry, we know, I mean, what, what Patagonia has done like, uh, this year. Um, so in the end, this is also, I think if for Patagonia consumer is even, I mean, something which is like, uh, I mean, they, they will always uh, remember about it and we're being a stronger on, on, on their heart. Um, in regards to Rossignol, we are very active uh, now in the sustainability, uh, in sustainability topics. We just launched uh, our first high recyclable ski and uh, all the action are, are are going here, uh, where the aim is also to play on the inclusivity and diversity being a sport that is not affordable for everybody. Mm. Um, the company also wants to put uh, to to give the opportunity to everybody to experience that kind of sport. Um, and so we are very active uh, on um, with social with local communities uh with uh, charity programs um in this period like any ski you buy online we will uh, basically give a ski to people in india um last year uh we did the reforest action in africa so for every order placed online we basically placed um plant a tree in uh, in tanzania uh, so, you know, if you can combine uh, this kind of actions uh, to what you do, like on a day to on a day to day, I think it's uh, an additional, an additional, let's say, um, a plus that you give uh, to your brand and um, people will most likely uh, be with you and uh, support the brand. So uh, to, to your point, to your question, um, storytelling is important, but it needs to be real and authentic and doesn't need to be storytelling for the sake of like telling a story but uh, um, I think yeah uh, brands that uh, really have a purpose um, and are authentically authentically mm, connected with the consumer um, will uh, will have more success than others yeah so <clears throat> and I imagine that you know to, to do the kind of things that you just referenced in regards to like storytelling in a real and authentic way that requires you having to to collaborate and partner very closely with with the marketing teams absolutely uh, yeah and and I guess you know that's part of the question as well as understanding you know is it in, if to, in your experience has ecom been part of uh marketing or has it been kind of more on the commercial side and, and if so how have you partnered with marketing to be able to deliver that storytelling? Through, yeah. um, through the the digital platforms. So I've delivered, I've experienced both, meaning that in these years I've been, I've seen e-commerce being put in marketing, being put in uh, in retail, being put like uh, elsewhere. So, but uh, I think, and it's it's sales. I mean, it's sales, uh, but it's also marketing, uh, but it's uh, experience. So I think um, in in all companies today, e-commerce, it's uh, it's it's set apart. I mean, I don't see e-commerce in any in any brand today being part of sales or marketing. But it's actually a um, more and more things have been added to e-commerce department. 
um, for instance, in many brands, um, e-tailers, uh, as I said, we also manage marketplace here. Um, it is basically, again, to control your distribution and your brand image, uh, especially digitally. Uh, of course, there are synergies that uh, you have to create like inside the company. Uh, and sometimes uh, for different reason, it is uh, actually managed by the same team. Marketing, it's broad. Um, in marketing, you have uh, media planning, you have PR, you have uh, upper funnel, you have low, I mean, you have mid funnel, you have uh, low funnel campaigns. And usually the campaigns that drive um, conversion, so all the low funnel campaigns usually sits uh, under directly under e-commerce because it's basically a key uh, for conversion. But whatever else, so up funnel, it is uh, all about the brand uh, because it's uh, about um, you know it's about events, it's about PR, it's about many things that happen uh, related to the brand, and then basically they they fulfill also the the low funnel. So once the the brand is is known, then people might look for the brand, or you might have more direct traffic, you might have more organic traffic. Um, so in the end, um, at the moment, I see the majority of the organization having the uh, low funnel marketing uh, really linked or managed yeah. by the e-commerce team. Also, because from technical perspective, it's a, it's a different, it's totally different uh, yeah. type of work and, and profiles. So yeah. in low in low in low funnel marketing in paid paid campaigns, it's all about KPIs. It's all about technical settings you know, it's of all these about campaigns. What? Sorry. Uh, it's all about KPIs. Okay, uh, it's not about data. It's all about uh, really analytical profiles. Also, when we say CRM, CRM, you have the content and brand and experience part, which is more a creative profile, a person that can really is good at telling something. It's about a visual, it's about graphic. But then you have the analytical part of the CRM, which is uh, could be a data scientist as a profile, mm-hmm. because it's all about crunching data, uh, what people order, when, uh, RFM analysis. And so it's diff- totally different profile. Like yeah. uh, it, then, then must be together because a data science data scientist usually doesn't have probably is not like inclined to uh, creative skills and storytelling mm-hmm. skills, and vice versa. Who is very creative most likely doesn't have the data scientist background. So it's it's all really uh, connected. So how yeah, we yeah. used to work, it's really to have more analytical business people like in e-commerce team. A retail team, but all the rest, it's really working day to day with marketing people to get the uh, the assets, to to get the story. And it's a circle because in the end, they need a brief also from us to understand what to create and 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 for what, from who and when. And so in the end, it's uh, basically a uh, four hands work. Yeah, no, definitely. And actually, I've worked on, on e-commerce, like director VP roles, where, yeah, one of the, like, when I get the briefing, they say, oh, actually, one new thing about this role is that now digital marketing is actually going to be reporting into e-commerce and dot line into marketing. And a, a lot of times it was, well, before it was always vice versa, right? It was always yeah. reporting in into marketing, end- dot line into e-commerce. Yeah, in the end, it's like an ecosystem. E-commerce, it's a small ecosystem. It's like a company in the company because it's the department that works with any department. Because with you, you work with finance. You go with accounting for many, many topics. You yeah. work with logistic, and e-commerce logistic is not the same as B two B or retail logistic. Um, customer service. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, I mean, being a customer service person, it's not only about uh, um, giving information about product or an order sheet, but it's also the tone of voice and actually also from a soft skills perspective, you need to manage those people like over the phone or email. And yeah. many times it's not easy to manage a frustrated customer that have an issue or a picky customer that have like are, are looking for some information. So although you can be the best B2B customer service person, doesn't need to be that doesn't doesn't mean that you can manage also I mean customer service uh, e-commerce without uh, probably some uh, uh, additional tools and I mean yeah. that, that yeah. And, and skills that that requires. Yeah. yeah, no, actually I did a session with um with Andrew Pearl from Profitero 
recently we did a LinkedIn Live, which is available on the podcast and on on YouTube, where the big topic that they that they talk about is that e-commerce is democratizing. So that means that every time more and more departments and the companies are involved in e-commerce, as you said, customer yeah. service, logistics, even finance, etc. Yeah. Speaking about democratizing, um, Laura. So we've seen recently that companies in the fast fashion space have started getting into ski. What do you think about that? Um, that's a good sign, I believe, <laughs> meaning that uh, skiing is uh, is on fire at the moment and sport is on fire. I think uh, some of them actually started a few years ago, but I think after COVID also all the sports, uh, all, all sports, I mean, got, uh, got got a boost because also people really thought about um, a more uh, healthy life and also experience uh, uh, outside uh, nature in summer and in winter. And uh, I think also COVID had, I mean, had an effect on, on that to really put people, bring people in the nature, uh, to escape in the nature, which is in the end also one of the call of Rossignol. I mean, Rossignol is, a, is an alpine brand. It's a mountain brand. And our aim is basically to bring people outside and to make them experience the nature and to um, give um, give an escape, even if it's just for one day. Mm-hmm. Um uh, of course, our day-to-day life, it's uh, it's tough sometimes. You have problems, you have, I mean, work, you have, I mean, many things to do. And sometimes you just want to switch off for one day and want to, and what's, I mean, the best is basically being, is basically being like in, uh, in, uh, in nature. Um, and I think many brands, uh, are doing the same. Uh, we, ourselves, uh, we have been collaborating with, uh, we've done a collaboration, uh, a couple of years now with, uh, with Balmain. So we also saw both fast fashion, but also luxury brands, yeah. uh, that never done like, uh, ski, ski wear, uh, doing ski wear. Um, so I think it's just, and also to my point before, it's also, I think it's a way to get a ski accessible. To, to any person yeah. because of course skiing it's it's an expensive sport um the stuff i mean the, the the clothing itself the gear itself it's expensive going there i mean buying a ski pass is expensive you need to drive to the place because you have to ski on the mountain and if you live on the seaside or somewhere else you need to get to the place um so i think it's also a way to to have ski wear, ski sport more accessible to people that uh, is just my i mean the way i see it but uh so to me it's like the trend and it's also because there is demand uh for sport yeah well I, and i think you you hit on something that's really interesting which is um that that the goal of rossignol is to help provide that escape for people and to to get them outside and be able to look at um their wellness in a more holistic sort of way. I think all of those things are continuing to remain important, um, at least from what I've seen with the economic situation as well, and that people during those, hard, you know, not just the hard times of COVID, but also now the hard times yeah. um, with the economy are also saying, Inflation. I, I, need, I yeah. need an escape, right? I need to, and actually, to be honest, they see it almost as a, um, as a treat to themselves, right? Which is like, it's, it's also self-care or self-love exactly. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Laura, given, you know, everything um, that, we, you know, we just talked about in terms of um, not just the, the COVID and now with the inflation and the economic situation and, you know, with new entrants coming into the uh, into the into the space, um, would love to just get your perspective in regards to some of the things you you kind of, in essence, uh, prioritize when it comes to leading and inspiring your team to be able to, to function at that high level in this fast changing environment? Um, to me, it all starts from, from people. So I think people are, are the key. Um, while you build your, you know, career path, while you make choices about your work, uh, always choose people and I mean, on top of brands. And this is what like, uh, in, in my team, actually we do, we, we work together 
um and we try to have fun and in the end it's it's work and but work it's a big part of your uh, daily life because it's more than eight hours per day um and yeah outside this stuff um again covid again inflation now there is a big worry in uh, ukraine and russia um and yeah we need to basically live with that um sometimes you also argue okay what is in the end my my job purpose now because all these things are happening but in the end that's that's life and i think being connected and being and have an authentic relationship with your colleague trust them talk to them um really spending time with uh, with them to understand like each other if there are frictions why they are there um i mean in my team particularly but i've seen this like happening and uh, sharing with many many colleagues in other company i mean resilience is the key uh we have been resilient for years uh we went through tough times uh, we are still in tough time. So I think in in the end, I mean, uh, this also became part of uh, a skill that it's, uh, I mean, this skill is like very, very important. Mm-hmm. And now looking back at the beginning of your career, Laura, if you had to talk to your younger self, now knowing what you know, and in hindsight, <laughs> what type of advice would you give to yourself? Uh, what's the like one advice that you would give yourself at the beginning of your career? Hmm, that's a tough question. Um, well, I would say that, uh, yeah, always choose with uh, with your heart. And um, I, 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 I would say, as I said, I was lucky because I really work with good people. Um, so I would re- recommend to myself or other people, junior people, to really... Uh, to choose people on on the day to day, it's not about uh, your boyfriend or girlfriend, your partner, uh, but it's also at work. You need to choose like uh, your people because in the end, it's uh, as I said, it's really what people makes makes your day. And uh, you can be in an amazing brand, but actually, if you don't really, I mean, uh, get along with uh, some people, then in the end, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be fun. So you need to have fun, you need to take it seriously, uh, you need to be committed, um, but uh, in the end, you can also make choices because you can also choose where actually you want to you want to be. And especially in uh, in some industry, because also that's, that's, that's true. I mean, today there are some people that, um, I mean, the change, the change, the, the world has changed, is changing every day, technology go fast. So actually you need to invest in yourself. You need to invest in your education. You need to invest on, in, on yourself, even if while you are working. I mean, sometimes I see people, younger people than me and I say, oh my God, I mean, probably I don't know about the latest technologies and stuff like that because these things go so fast. Um, so you really need to stay abreast on on what what happened uh, actually uh, every time, and don't sit down even if you are you have a good job, you are happy. Never be like satisfied and depressed. I mean, you can be satisfied, but be curious and try to understand what's what's next or what's uh, more behind that. Uh, I think it would be so my what made me uh, here also because you know if you stay always in your place, in your comfort zone. Uh, I think also going out from your comfort zone, uh, it's always a good thing uh, for yourself. This was Laura Benedettino, Group VP, Omnichannel Director Consumer at Rossignol. Efrain, are you looking forward to your next ski trip more than before? Absolutely. And, you know, as I, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm not a, an expert skier by any means. My, my daughter is the skier in the family. But uh, um, if nothing else, I'm definitely going to go check out the Rossignol store here in Paris and um, aspire to be a better skier than I am uh, after hearing Laura's story. Excellent. What are the, for you, what are the main takeaways and conclusions after this, this conversation with Laura? To me, it's really fascinating to to hear about Laura's journey in her career and to to really um, learn from her in regards to how digital as a as a function or as a space has really evolved. I mean, she's been in it since two thousand and nine, and she's kind of in essence see it um, 
manifest in a, in a bunch of different ways across the different companies she's worked at and um, to see where it was then and where companies were in terms of like it's called their digital capabilities to where they are now is uh, is really in, insightful for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. And for me, a big takeaway was the fact that consumer doesn't know what channel means. So they don't really know what wholesale, retail, uh, online. I mean, they do, but probably wholesale, they don't a lot of times. So when we, you work in the industry, you probably get out, we get over obsessed with the different channels when at the end of the day, it's all about brand and product and, and giving the consumers what they want. No. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like, I think, you know, as you said, Daniel, for those of us in the industry, we're very familiar and comfortable with the term omni-channel. But I think if you were to stop um, the general consumer on the street and ask them point blank to explain what omni-channel meant, um, you probably would be, um, you know, you wouldn't be surprised that, that, that they wouldn't know what that meant. So um, you're right. I think um, for consumers, they really don't care, right? They really just think more about the brand or the retailer in terms of the experience. And um, I thought it was really interesting as well to hear uh, Laura talk about the importance of storytelling uh, in what they do at Rossignol and uh, the need uh, to, to do that in a very real and authentic way, yeah. um, whatever that means in terms of like how it aligns to um, the company's values and, and the consumer's values for that company as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was interesting as well that someone that's in a commercial function like she is really put so much emphasis on that, no? Because really we were we were asking about like commercial questions, but she answered with a marketing answer, which I think is really telling, no, about like the blurring of the lines. Yeah, no, I think, uh, well, that's probably what makes her good at her job, right? Which is that yeah. she's able to, in essence, play in both of those worlds. And really, I think in a lot of ways, digital kind of serves as a, a bit of that glue with that, right? Because um, as, as Laura mentioned, you know, they're one of the few groups or functions in an organization that really touches almost all the parts of the business, right? And almost operates as a as a mini business within the larger corporation. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, thanks, Efrain, for your conclusions as always. Uh, and thanks to our audience for being here and supporting us in this new year 2023 remember if you're not yet to follow us on linkedin um i've mentioned it before but we've also started a youtube channel where you can listen to our audio podcast but also revisit the live sessions that we've done on linkedin in the past as well as uh, the the weekly video series that we have on our linkedin page you can also watch them on youtube um shout out also to our friends the cpg guys at the other side of the atlantic who are producing amazing content. Uh, so hi to Peter and Shri. And looking forward to seeing you in the next episode of the FMCG Guys podcast. Have a great day. Bye.